Welcome back to Plakeside Studios, everyone. Ryan here, and on this installment of The Tone Engineer, we're exploring early Marshall and later Wizard tones that helped define the sound of Metallica in the 80s and 90s with Kill 'Em All, Ride the Lightning, Reload, and Garage Incorporated. <laughs> I kicked this series off earlier this year with Metallica's iconic Mesa Boogie tone, so I'd actually planned to get to a couple other bands before I did this video, but you, the audience, voted to see this one first. So here we are. Hopefully we can get to uh, some of those other ones sooner rather than later. But regardless, I also wanted to throw in the 90s Wizard amp albums as well, since that also has some thematically appropriate British amplifier tones, though they are quite different, and I'll show you how you can get those tones using the same sort of amplifier platform, though the one we'll be using today is far more capable than just simple 2203 variants of tone. So just like with the past videos, I will have a couple pieces of gear that were actually featured on their respective albums, but for the most part, all this stuff is quite different. It might be close, but uh, by the time you add them all together, you get a sound that I still think is very respectable and is more than adequate for a cover or to use as a baseline to try to get your own tone. But you stack this up next to the album tones and they are very, very close, I think. Um, but there are gonna be differences and the differences you hear isn't necessarily because of the gear we're using. Um, people tend to forget that, especially on these older albums, you know, stuff like Kill 'Em All and Ride the Lightning, they were sped up. Um, so that's why you have to tune to 425 hertz-ish to match the album tuning, which I did in this case, at least for the recordings. But there's also things like the mixing and mastering process and the guitars being at least double tracked, quad tracked, even octa tracked in some areas that thicken it up. And then it's bounced to tape and compressed and all this stuff that results in a guitar sound at the end of the day that may not sound exactly like what's coming out of the amplifier raw, but overall this is the same sort of philosophy. So don't forget that. Um, if you're, you know, furiously typing in the comment section that, oh, you're missing this part of the sound or this is different. Well, it's not necessarily because of the gear. It's because of how it's been recorded. So you have to take that into account. But regardless, let's start with Kill 'Em All. This is Metallica's premier iconic album. Obviously, this helped to define the thrash metal guitar tone as we know it. My dirty little secret regarding this album is this is actually my least favorite Metallica guitar tone. I know that's probably heresy to some people, but if I'm gonna jam on these songs or even like earlier Megadeth tracks, anything in that kind of genre, then I love this sound, it, it, it's really fitting. But if I was just to plug my own guitars in and like try to come up with something, absolutely not. It's just so thin and scratchy when you set it next to some of Metallica's later guitar tones that I think are perfect. Uh, but this is an important one nonetheless, and it's one I wanted to go over. Uh, because it uses some very strange gear, or not so strange, but stuff that I would never see myself playing. So let's start with the guitar, as always. This is, of course, the era 
of James' famous Electra Flying V, the Gibson Flying V clone tunematic bridge. Think it had uh, something like Seymour Duncan Invaders, some passive pickup, whatever. Um, but of course, that eventually broke in an on-stage incident, if I remember right, before he switched to Jackson V shortly, and then of course to explore shaped guitars with EMG active pickup. So you can kind of get by with a, a ratty guitar because since that's exactly what he was using. So in that same spirit, I thought I would bring my old Epiphone Les Paul out of the closet. This was basically my first real guitar, and there's no telling how many hours I dicked around with these songs on this exact instrument. I was having a electrical problem. I think I've got a bad pot and a bad switch. So I ended up just like tearing everything off and took the cover off the pickup and wired the bridge straight to output. So if that's not thrash metal, I don't know what is. So no volume tone controls for me, but this actually sounds very similar to that kind of classic guitar. So don't worry about, you know, getting the shape exactly the same. As long as it's like a set neck kind of tunematic type guitar, you'll be fine. Um, I also find that the later EMG tones work fine. We're going to be smashing the dynamics with distortion anyway. And um, the later EMG 81 equipped guitar sounds great. Uh, as many of you correctly pointed out in the last installment of this, I used EMGs for Master of Puppets. Sounded fine, but James used passive pickups on that. So it's really just not that big of a deal. On to our amp rig then. We'll start the signal chain with this little mosky. Black Rat Distortion. Can you guess what this is based off of? So purportedly, Kill 'Em All had a Proco Rat that was boosting their amplifiers at the time. And I don't know what the settings were. I don't know to what extent that pedal was used, but I just dialed in something that sounds pretty close to me. And that album is definitely drenched in that Proco Rat loose, almost fuzz-like distortion. This isn't like your Tube Screamer derivative, so you have to dial it in in a very different way. Um, it has kind of a treble filter, similar to what you might find on a um, older fuzz pedal, and it's a different beast. But overall, it has this like, it sounds like your amp's about to explode <laughs> kind of distortion profile to it. Um, and it, again, this album just sounds like that the entire way through. So I chose to get a clone of a Proco Rat because the vintage ones are outrageously expensive and the Proco Rat 2, I don't really like all that much, and the used prices are almost exactly the same as new. So it's like, nah, I think I'll just buy a Chinese knockoff. So this very well may be made on the same line as like a Moore pedal or a Moen pedal, since they all kind of share a similar logo. Don't know about that, but regardless, this thing is like 30 bucks or less. You get the vintage mode and a turbo mode, which is actually easier to dial in in my opinion, but the vintage mode is where it's at for Kill 'em All. So the way I've got this set is filter completely rolled off. The higher you go, at least on this model, sometimes it's backwards um, on different derivatives, but the higher you go here, it gets very trebly and ice pick sounding and does not work at all. So I'm just using this as a straight boost, filter dialed all the way back, a generous amount of volume, about one o'clock, and then distortion. I've got a little past nine, maybe about 10 o'clock, and this is kind of that area where I felt like the output volume compared to the breakup was right around the right area for me. But it's going to depend on the pedal. Either way, for Kill 'Em All, you're going to want a pedal that does something like that. You can get by with a Tube Screamer. You can get by with other symmetrical or even asymmetrical clipping diode pedals, but uh, it's just not the same without a rat. Now, the exact amplifier head used on Kill 'Em All is up for a bit of debate. Some people will say it's just a plain 59 Super Lead. Others say it's JMP2203 Master Volume, either of which may or may not have been Jose modded. My guess, just based on some of the pictures I've seen, is towards the 2203 side of things, but it really doesn't matter. I think as long as you have a Master Volume Plexi or Plexi derivative style amp, it's going to work. It just, it's not that important. You will want Master Volume though, because we're going to be cranking the gain quite high. Um, and any lack of distortion you might have, you could probably make up for turning some of the stuff up on the rat. But anywhere in that early JCM 800 or JMP 2203 area is, is gonna do fine. So to cover that, I'm using my Chariotone Gargoyle Hot Rod Plexi. And the cool thing about this amp, besides having you know your standard sort of British style uh, tone stack controls and all that good stuff, we have cascading gain control. So you can kind of filter in and out how much high frequency distortion you want. Gain one is more or less focused on that. Gain two kind of behaves more like your regular plexi style normal 
channel um, you know, kind of gain, although it, it, it's got plenty of headroom. This thing can absolutely scream, or you can take advantage of like the low input and make it almost entirely clean. So on the high channel, I've got this dialed in where gain one's about at noon at five, and then gain two at eight, and this would kind of balance out to be sort of like a JCM 800 around seven. Um, and then our tone stack is not exactly what I have to what James purportedly dialed his in at the time, but it, it definitely gets in that scratchy territory. So treble maxed, I know, uh, middle at noon and then bass around six. I also have presence completely maxed out as well and uh, the depth circuit off, seeing as how, you know, that wasn't really a thing on those old school amplifiers. Um, in the room, this thing is like ear bleeding. It's not, you know, even on the quieter volumes, it's just so scratchy, uh, but, it's kind of what it's meant to sound like. By the time you mic it up, it definitely changes. But uh, this is something that, you know, for my own personal taste, I would dial back the treble. I could stand to even have the present circuit off completely, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sound, we'll say that much. I also have one of the bright switches engaged. This is the 4700 Pico Farad cap. Uh, kind of sounds more like the, you know, higher gain treble channels or bright caps that were used on those amps at that time. Another advantage this amplifier has though is an effects loop and I wanted to take advantage of that to get just a little bit closer to the kill em all sound without having to use outboard gear or relying on plugins or whatever. So in the effects loop, I have my trusty MXR 10 band. I've got basically a little bit of a bump to 500 Hertz, a little bit even on 250, 1000, um, a little bitty boost to presence of like 4K and 8K, but really this is just kind of give that mid range honk that's presence on the album and is really um, used to dial in my cabinet a little better, but we'll get to that in a moment. So um, on all these tones, I'll be taking advantage of the 10 band EQ. So if you've got anything like that, whether it be parametric or graphic, it definitely helps for the style of tones. Finally, I have a Boss RV5 that's taking care of some of the room reverb sounds. Again, depending on how you would record this kind of stuff, you may not need this, but um, for more reasonable volume levels, Kill em All has a lot of reverb as well as Ride the Lightning. So I decided to use this at about 40% level and similar settings for time and tone on the room setting just to kind of give that old school studio sound. There's also like something like a, a slap back delay on the different channels. You can kind of hear when guitars are solo, but I didn't go after that. Regardless, you know, this just sounds more like you're recording in a, a big studio. So definitely optional, but I found it to be kind of the, the missing final touch to make it sound like kill them all. All of that, of course, goes through this T75 equipped Marshall 2x12, though exactly what speakers and cab was used on kill them all is again, a subject for debate. Some people have said that it's just greenbacks. Other people say it's 65 creambacks like later albums. I don't think it really matters all that much as long as you're using some 4x12 Marshall sounding enclosure because this thing very much does that job. And as long as you can kind of compensate it for it with other gear like graphic EQ or changing your tone stack settings a bit, then you'll get close enough. Um, but I am using a single SM57 microphone because the last Metallica video was so phase heavy, multi mic setups, you got one close mic, one in the room. It was just a nightmare to have to deal with. So didn't want to do that again, but you really don't have to. I think all these tones we're covering today actually works fine with a single mic and you can you know switch between different models depending on what you have but i found for kill em all just pointing it straight at the dust cap maybe an inch off center and then a couple inches back from the speaker cloth was the ticket and uh it, it sounds raw and nasally and nasty as you might expect so um with that let's cover a couple different things here i'll show you what the Pedal sounds like on and off, to kind of get an idea of how the amplifier is dialed in. And spoiler alert, it's very treble heavy. And then we'll switch between the actual cabinet mic sound and what you'd hear with the impulse response. That way you can get an idea of what to expect with you know minimal post-processing versus if you were to use this in a direct application. And of course, I will provide all these IRs again for those of you that uh, were interested in that.
the next album, I've changed out only one piece of gear, although the results are quite different. So we're now starting our signal chain with the Ibanez Tube Screamer Mini, not changing the guitar just like Hetfield did, but this is basically Ibanez's small form factor Tube Screamer. It's got the same sort of TS9 circuit. And I've got it dialed in so that level is at max. We've got tone right around noon, so it's in that 720-ish hertz sweet spot. And just a touch of overdrive, since this isn't actually all that much of like a distortion type pedal, I'm just using this to get just a touch of compression, so a little bit of grittiness to the incoming signal. I don't want to change the overall amp sound all that much, but uh, this is used just to kind of, you know, do the classic metal boost. Purportedly, uh, James actually doesn't like Tube Screamers and quit using them after this point. And in fact, I'm not sure that his tracks were even all that much filled with Tube Screamers, but uh, Kirk Hammett was using them at that point and continue to use them for some time, and I get the Ride the Lightning sound out of this way. So you probably got quite a bit of leverage with um, that pedal as well. But what is known is that the amplifiers they used on Kill em All were basically stolen at some point, so they did have to change over to JCM 800 heads for Ride the Lightning. These are the same ones that were later modified to be used basically as slave power amps. And to reflect that, I actually didn't change a whole lot here, but uh, according to online resources, he did continue to scoop the shit out of the mids around this point. So treble, I've rolled back only to nine, only nine, I know. Uh, middle is at a whopping one and bass is at six, no presence here. And this is to achieve that kind of scooped out really uh, low end heavy sound you get on Ride the Lightning. I didn't change the gain or the bright switch, still going into the high input as well. Changing the tone stack settings on its own wasn't gonna cut it though, so I also made some modifications to the 10 band, which resulted in this sort of twin peak type of thing where at 250 and 8K, you got a little bit of a bump around each frequency and then uh, a little bit of a scoop at one and 2K. And this very much reflects the overall sonic signature of that album. The palm mutes become just massive. Uh, there's just this perfect chug quality that makes Ride the Lightning one of my favorite recorded Marshall tones ever, and probably my favorite for standard tuned material. It's just so hard to replicate um, without having something like this. Um, of course, if you're going through microphone preamps and all that, I'm sure getting the recorded tones fine, but um, in the room, it's, it's something that can be a bit difficult. But all that combined, it, it actually turned out to be something that's quite similar. And then still going through the same cabinet, but this was an album that was supposedly recorded with 65 creambacks. So these are really close to those speakers in terms of their sonic signature. Now the microphone did see some movement as well, still sticking with the SM57. I didn't actually change the position of the microphone stand hardly at all. In fact, the distance is basically identical, but it did tilt it 45 degrees or roughly around that to point near the edge of the dust cap, almost right on the cone. So we're in that kind of grisly speaker area and all those factors combined help make it the ride the lightning tone as we know and love. So let's do the same thing, demo that out, show you kind of what my tube screamer is doing here so you can get an idea of the amplifier. I'll uh, do the same thing with the cabinet impulse responses. And I did forget the reverb, although uh, didn't change much here except move the model to hall. Um, though I, I have been playing around with the settings and I kind of like different stuff for different songs. But overall, um, it's more or less the same layout, just a different overdrive pedal and compensating with the tone stack, EQ, and mic position to get the differences you hear. <laughs>
Our final rig for the day will cover two albums worth of tones, with those differences simply lying in change settings and mic positions and that kind of good stuff. I've downsized in one way, we've ditched the reverb pedal because there's no real appreciable reverb that you hear on the rhythm tones, though if you wanted to, you could absolutely keep with that. But otherwise, I've only swapped out an overdrive pedal in the cabinet, as well as the guitar. So I've changed over to my Wild Audio Blood Eagle because this is an Explorer-shaped guitar with an EMG-81 in the bridge, and that's mainly the thing that matters, as well as the Gibson scale length. But this was during the prime time of James Hetfield playing Explorer-shaped guitars with EMG pickups. So um, this is tuned to everything, uh, anywhere between E-flat standard, C-sharp standard, D standard. They played a lot of different tunings depending on the songs uh, at that point. So you'll hear that reflected in the demos. Anything that can handle that in terms of string gauges and guitar setup is what you'll want though. Again, this isn't super uh, picky in terms of what guitar you're using, but I do think the Gibson scale length helps and anything with a tunematic bridge especially just gets the right amount of chug and it's more about feel for me more than anything. So that's the guitar we're sticking with. The interesting part of this equation is once again the amps and effects because this whole load reload era of Metallica is where they took basically every amp under the sun and threw it in their studio. Uh, load was a mix of two or three different Mesa Boogie amps, a 2203 style amp. James began you know, flirting with diesel VH4s at that point and continues to use them today. Uh, but another amp that I think also saw some use on Hardwired to self-destruct was the Wizard Modern Classic. And this is a hell of an amp with a price tag to match, which is why you don't see it sitting here. Um, but it's also one that hardly ever gets modeled, but it's something that you can cover most of that ground with a similarly souped up plexi circuit. Uh, because that's basically what it is, but it kind of takes different elements of what makes old school high watts cool and uh, plexis and kind of, you know, puts them all in a blender and spits out a really badass amplifier. This was kind of the same sort of amps that even Angus Young used on tour at one point. Um, they sound really cool. There's a squishiness to their gain structure that almost reminds you of like an of old, you know, SLO 100 or um, early dual rectifier, but it's undoubtedly British voice. Um, but you can still get something very aggressive and contemporary out of it. So it was a really great fit, I think, for the James Hetfield style around the Reload and Garage Inc. eras. And so that's what we're going to try to sound like today um, with this rig here. So, of course, I'm using the same Chariot Tone Gargoyle. I didn't change too many settings from last time for the Ride the Lightning stuff. I did um, add a little bit more on Gain 1 just to add in a little more high frequency content. I think the Wizards do something similar. You could definitely tell there's some filtering going on in the Gain stages. Um, but everything else pretty much the same. Left depth alone, you could definitely turn that up if you wanted to since Reload and Garage Inc. are very low and heavy. Now this amp on its own already sounds fantastic. It's a really articulate, crunchy gain sound with these settings, but it's not as saturated as I want. It's not um, you know, quite as squishy as you hear on those two albums. So to make up for that, I'm using the Full Tone OCD drive pedal. And this isn't actually all that inaccurate because James was supposedly uh, pairing his Wizard amps with the Love Tone Brown Source pedal, which is a similar sort of idea to that. It's kind of like an amp channel in a box more than just like a Tube Screamer clone, though you might think that at first when you see gain level and tone controls, but it has a couple different modes. It's supposed to be like the brown sound. Um, once again, those things are outrageously expensive, but between all these tones we're talking about, I don't think it's really necessary because this does a similar thing where, you know, this isn't your Tube Screamer. Number one, the output level, the headroom is just insane. Uh, you'll hear how much gain this adds with volume all the way back here. This is higher than I think some Tube Screamers are maxed out. It's insane. Um, the drive is not like a clipping diode type profile. This is driven off of MOSFETs, which actually results in a much more amp-like shark fin kind of distortion wave character. And when you cascade that into a tube amp, it just sounds like you've turned up more gain. It's, it's very natural. It doesn't sound like you're slamming an amp with like a, you know, a solid state pedal. It, it just adds more, which I really like about it. And um, then the tone control, it does some, you know, similar filtering technique that you might be familiar with, but it's much more open, um, not as focused sounding, but also not flubby, but not overly razor tight either. Um, all these things just make this just a, a really cool amp channel in the box of sorts. But again, when you dial it like this, it plays well with high gain stuff. 
And all that changes depending on if you're on the HP switch or LP switch. Um, on the HP, this is a bit higher gain and uh, more aggressive in your face. So out of all the boost pedals that I've shown in this video today, this is the one that I'm without a doubt the most impressed by. It can do anything from add just a touch of gain on top of a clean amp to push an already articulate amp into just full blown saturation. And this is something that I'm using to make this amp just kind of sound like a different amp. It doesn't sound like it's boosted really. It just kind of changes the character a bit and adds that kind of squishy high watt type nature that I really like about the wizard stuff. So also still using the graphic EQ, I've cut basically everything around 500 Hertz because reload is very, uh, I mean, there's mids there, don't get me wrong, but the, the frequencies where they scoop the mids very much changed um, where it wasn't so much at the amp level. This changed as well for Garage Ink, so I moved it up a little bit, but overall it's the same sort of philosophy. Then we get to the cabinet. I'm using my Mesa Boogie oversized cabinet with Vintage 30s. This was again around that era where James had completely fallen in love with Vintage 30s and was using like standard Mesa Boogie stuff, uh, continues to use those on stage. So this, you know, it was a very good fit for that. And the microphone positions, um, some of which were 45 degrees, others a little bit more straight on, but uh, kind of the same philosophy as the last time where I wanted that grisly area of the uh, speaker cone to be accentuated. But again, depending on what you're using, you're gonna have to kind of play around with all the settings in tandem. But because this was already a, a decently close approximation to what they were using, I felt like it wasn't as hard as getting Kill em All and um, Ride the Lightning. So again, we'll go through the same exercise, show the IRs, the cabs, and what this sounds like on and off, and give you a couple more tones from Reload and Garage Ink, at least the second side. We're not talking about the garage days. This is simply what they recorded in the 90s. <laughs> Just because your guitar rig consists of more digital components doesn't mean you can't get in on some of this Metallica action. So if you're a Fractal Audio user, I'll have presets for the AX8, Axe FX2, and Axe FX3 available in the link in the description below. You will have to download the separate impulse response and load them into your user cabs and point it to it on a per patch basis as always. But to go over those real quickly, we have... Four, so one for each album on the kill em all patch i'm using the rat distortion model into the standard british 800 the mod works well as well but 
I found the standard 800 sounded just fine. Got a light gate, a delay and reverb to kind of match some of those in the room sounds you're hearing on the album. And of course the custom user cab for the ride the lightning sound. It's pretty much the same overall signal chain, swapping out the rat with the TS-808 OD and sticking with the 800, though I've dialed in a couple different settings on the tone stack and threw in my own GEQ settings as well. The reverb, I've also changed accordingly. Since the Fractal firmware lacks any wizard models, I'm using what I consider to be the next best thing or perhaps even the better thing with the Cameron CCV. This is on the 2D setting and that is paired with the Fractal FET boost and that kind of gives you that OCD paired sound we were getting with the real amplifiers. Again, using the user cabinets and basically the same setup for the garage ink tones with a couple minor tweaks here and there. The previous T side of things sees the return of some of my favorite plugins as well as some new ones. So we're starting off Kill 'em All with the TSE R47. It's quite the quality rat plugin, sounds just like it as far as I'm concerned. That goes into the JCM 800 preamp, which was provided by Mercurial Audio, completely free. Sounds really great. Sounds like a Marshall. That goes into an Ignite Amps Power Amp plugin, the TP81, and finishing it off with NAT IR Classic to load the impulse response. You can use whatever program you see fit there. Same signal chain for Ride the Lightning with some different settings, and of course, swapping out that rat pedal for once again, TSE 808, which is TSE's own interpretation of the Tube Screamer. For both Reload and Garage Inc., I swapped out the overdrive pedal for the TS999 Sub Screamer by Ignite Amps. This has a fat and asymmetrical switch, which kind of brings it more in line with that whole amp in a box sound, though not quite to that extent, though it's not really needed as much since the preamp simulation Lex Stack by Poulin more or less takes care of most of that on its own. This is supposed to be a Bogner Ecstasy. I have it on the red channel, the center bright switch engaged, the boost engaged, and a little bit of power amp compression with the output control there. You can see I have it extremely scooped, a lot of bass, not much treble, uh, not a lot of mids and all the contour as such. I didn't need as much gain, but this kind of handles that same wizard overdriven Marshall sound that we're getting earlier. I still pair it with TP81 to fine tune the depth circuit. And then of course, once again, using the user cabs, and this is what it sounds like. <laughs> So that'll basically do it for today's Tone Engineer installment. Hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I did. These are a ton of work. They're a lot of fun, very educational. Um, but again, they, they take a lot of time to make and develop and edit and all that stuff. So if you do like this video, please let me know. Comment, like, subscribe, bill, all that bullshit. I hate like begging, but apparently it works or else people wouldn't do it. So if you do, uh, then consider that. That'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you, phone. I don't even care. I'm not starting this part over. It's just <laughs> it's been a long video. Um, but anyway, I really liked what was going on with the Ride the Lightning tones. They're among my favorite classic Metallica sounds ever, but this was so good. This whole amp cab pedal combination that I'm going to base the next one off of this setup uh, with a plexi pedal platform. So do stick around if you're interested in this series at all. I think it's going to be another good one. 
And then going forward, you might have noticed I've had like four of these videos back to back for four months and then I took a couple months off. Uh, what I plan to do going forward is two on, one off. Um, one every month is just, it takes up too much time and I don't have enough gear right now to do all the ones that I want to do anyway. So that'll help me procure some of this stuff and uh, not be so burnt out on doing it all the time. Man, I'm popular today. Sweet. So uh, with that, thanks for watching. Any other questions, comments, please leave them down below and we hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.